So, uh, good morning, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our transport thematic day here at COP23. Could I ask you for a big favour? We have a very big room. Could I get you to move towards the front a little bit? So for those of you who are further back, could you move up towards the front so that we can make it slightly more intimate in the scale of this uh, room which has been uh, provided for us this morning? Uh, that invitation applies to everyone, so if you're sat down there, can you move forward a little bit, please? Thank you. Now, everybody who is uh, here self-evidently has an interest in the transport uh, theme, and it's very good that uh, for several years now, uh, transport is one of the pillars that's come in from the cold. It's good that transport is inside, is engaged, is involved, and is part of the partnership process. We know the scale of the emissions related to the transport uh, sector, which accounts for about a quarter of uh, global uh, CO2 energy emissions. Uh, there's been a lot of attention and growing attention to the transport contribution and pillar within the nationally determined contributions. And really the purpose of this morning's session is an overview for what follows today, because we're looking, uh, we're deep diving a bit into freight and maritime and other sectors. But right now, it's to try to get a bigger picture. Since the Paris Agreement and with the follow-up in Marrakesh, what's been going on? Who is doing what? And where is it bringing us? So it's really, that's the purpose of this session, to set the scene, to get the feeling, to mark the progress. It is, in a way, a quick review and a sense of the outlook and the perspective uh, that we're moving to. Now, we've, for that, I think, a panel that is very well placed to help us. And I'm going to begin by asking Virginie Dumoulin uh, from the French Ministry to introduce to us what are you doing in France because we associate, of course, the high objectives with the Paris Agreement, but you've been very busy in France trying to turn big objectives into something real and operational. What are you doing? How are you doing it? And what kind of time perspective do you have on it? So, over to you, Virginie. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> do you hear me? I, I, I'm not used to this kind. Ah, yeah, that works. No, I hear the echo. <laughs> so it means that it works. Okay. Uh, what do we do in France? Well, we do a lot of things, of course. Um, uh, as, you, as you can imagine, of course, uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement is a national priority. It's very clear on the political, at the political level and uh, at the highest uh, level of the state because the, the French president, Mr. Macron, is very clear on how important it is that the Paris Agreement is implemented all over the world and, of course, in France and in Europe. Uh, which is our di direct uh, responsibility. Uh, we are uh, planning um, to have a, a new orient orientation law that will be adopted next year. Um, this is very important uh, on transport, I mean, no? uh, new orientation law on, on transport. Because uh, what we think that in France, uh, our main priority will be given to daily uh, mobility. Uh, this, we already have a lot of infrastructures, uh, road infrastructures, airports, uh, ports, uh, all these kind of uh, infrastructure, we already have them. Uh, what we really need now is to reinforce uh, daily mobility. Uh, so this is this uh, law uh, that is planned for next year, and to prepare this law, we are doing a consultation process that is occurring just uh, how we are speaking. It was uh, starting in September and it will last until the 13th of December. Uh, and this is something what we call, it's difficult to translate in English, so I'm going to say it in French, assise de la mobilité. Um, so it means uh, mobility, uh, um, general state, state, well, I don't know how to, to translate it, but what, what is it? It is um, a, a meeting of all the stakeholders, all of them, 
the companies, the, 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 the collectivities who are, who are really powerful in transport and really working on it. Of course, the state authority, uh, the unions, um, the, the uh, GNOs, uh, the citizens, all these people uh, have meeting together regularly at national level, but also in the country. Uh, next uh, next uh, meeting is in Strasbourg, and the minister, Mrs. Bourne, will be uh, will be in Strasbourg for this meeting, and we are having exchanges uh, to see what are the main priority for the French people, and for uh, the stakeholders. What do they need? Uh, if we have to do a law, it has to be uh, oriented where the needs are. So this is what we do uh, for the time being. So it's too early to tell you uh, what will be the result, but what I can tell you already is that, of course, uh, the, the decarbonation of transport is raising up. Of course, it's one of the main subjects. It's one of the subjects on which uh, all the meetings are talking about. This is something that will be in the, in the core business. So clearly, our priority is to take into account the, the reduction of emission coming from land transport. This is clearly one of our main priority. As you may know, we adopted a climate plan in uh, July, beginning of July, and in the climate, climate plan, one of our flag measures is, uh, is uh, banning the sales of vehicles emitting uh, GHGs by 2040, which is a clear objective uh, that now we have to put in place. Uh, we are not the only country in Europe doing that. Uh, Netherlands is doing it. The UK is also having the same kind of target. But whatever, all together, we have to plan it and to put it in place. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, the, the climate coalition and transport uh, coming from the uh, uh, action agenda, the French part of this, is clearly in the Assise de la Mobilité and participating and being very helpful and pushing forward all the subjects they are pushing here too. So in this, really decarbonation of transport mm -hmm. is really in the, in, the, in the center. I just want to add that also it's very important that also we will work on mass mobility and new mobility uh, because it's very important to fulfill the needs of all citizens. This is something very important for my minister, uh, Mr. Nicolas Hulot. Um, and, and you know, the name of the minister here is not very well uh, uh, yes. written. Well, it's more clear because there you see that we have a big ministry doing at the same time transport, ecology, energy, climate, risk. But the name of the ministry is, uh, is different. It's Ministry for an Ecological and Solidary Transition. And I think this is very important because there is this idea of transition. So it says that we're going to move forward and change the things slowly. And also, this is, uh, uh, there is the solidarity inside the title of the mm. ministers. And mm. so this is coming back to what I was saying. We have to make a law that will really take into account the needs of everybody. Uh, even the people who are in diffuse territory, mm. we want to reduce their GHG's emission, but they, ha they have to have a car mm. to go to work, to, to do their daily needs. So we have to find solution also for those people. And this is very, very important. We have to think about everybody. And to conclude quickly, I, 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 I also want to say that there are two other sectors that are very important. Of course, maritime transport very important, uh, contributes 2.8% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And so we really think that the works going on at the IMO uh, must go on, and we push forward for having a, an ambitious target for the maritime transport uh, on emissions. It's really important. Mm -hmm. And the second, of course, uh, sector is the airline sector. Uh, aviation uh, has done its job because there is already an agreement at the uh, uh, ICAO. But now it has to be uh, concrete. We have to put this in concrete, transform this in concrete measures that will be applied and that will lead to reduction of the emission of the sector. And those two uh, sectors are also very important. We mustn't forget, because we all think about land transport, but there's also the maritime transport and the aviation. And all of them must contribute to the decarbonation of, of transport. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that introductory remark. Let me ask you one or two follow-up questions, if I could. On the climate plan that has been adopted, what are the headline goals for decarbonisation and transport, and by what time scale? You've mentioned already the question of vehicles. Do you have some other kind of big numbers and big dates attached to them 
in terms of the transport and decarbonisation agenda? Well, I, uh, as you may know, France is inside the European Union. Mm. So what we have to do is also something we have to do inside the EU with our main partners. And there was a proposition by the Commission, for example, on Wednesday uh, about the emission of vehicles and the planning. And this is one new proposition on which we have to work all together, all the member states, to, to push it mm -hmm. to a more ambitious uh, uh, target because for the time being uh, we're going to see because it was just the, the, it's the starting the proposition just met the, the the commission just met the proposition but we really need to work on this and see what we can do together and of course we are working very hard also with uh, the industry because the industry is in is in the core center of what we can do so uh, uh, it's very important that the industry also feel concerned. So it's too early to say that we already have uh, um, um, a detailed plan. We are at that, at that at the time in the discussion at European level, at the French level, with the with the companies, with the business, with the industry. But this is for sure that we can't say just oh we wait until 2040 and we will see. Mm. We have to have plans for 2020, for 2025, for 2030, for 2035. Because it's very important that for the industry they have a clear view of mm. what is coming and like that they can adapt themselves. Or, or they, they, we can't ask them to change everything if it's not uh, planned. So it's very important sure. that we... So, I mean, the, so. W w your emphasis there is on the indispensable role of public policy leadership to offer certainty to OEMs in manufacturing Absolutely. and to others. The second question, and, and uh, briefly just to explore, this idea of les assises de la mobilité. France is used to, you know, Grenelle écologique uh, and various assises. It's a methodology that perhaps others don't know or not familiar with. What does the assise look like? Is it is it kind of, as it moves around the country, one big assembly? Does it have separate pillars dealing with separate issues? How is it organized as a structure of engagement, mobilization, and communication? Well, you're right. This is a, a quite of a tradition in France that we are doing this. You were mentioning the Grenelle de l'Environnement, which was in, a, in, a, in 27 and 8, and uh, all sectors, energy, transport, uh, agriculture, food, health, of course, and all together with citizens, companies, NGOs, unions, all discussion. I would say that each uh, kind of consultation is different, but uh, there's never just one big assembly and that's all, mm -hmm. never. Uh, most of the time what we have is different a uh, way of uh, meeting between the people. There's uh, uh, well, what is important, what is always the same is that we've got uh, everybody is concerned. So we've, we will have each time the companies, all the economical sector, the political sector, so the administration, and also uh, Senate, Parliament, uh, of course, always collectivities, very important, because they are the ones who are implemented, implementing the, the policies, um, and also NGOs and citizens. Uh, this is the broadest we can, the better it is. This is something we will always have. And then, most of the time, you've got s the different groups Mm -hmm. And for the Assis de la Mobilité, this is what was done. There are different uh, groups on different subjects. Uh, some people are working on decarbonation of transport, mm -hmm. other ones are working on innovation, other ones are working on mass transport. So this is, this is uh, different ideas. And then what we also try to do, and is very important, is that we try to do things at national level and, tr and other things at regional level. Because it's also important that people who live uh, in their area uh, can be touched by the, the, um, the question we are asking, the fact that they can give their opinion okay. and they can participate. Because what is important in the end is that the more and the more people participate. And then it's only, of course, consultation and participation. Mm. So people don't decide anything. Yes, yeah. They just make proposition that will inspire later the law. After the Grenelle de l'Environnement, there were two laws. Mm. And therefore, the assis, there will be uh, mm. one ori orientation law. Uh, to conclude, I, I can say that at the time being, we have two process. We have the assis de la mobility. And uh, we also have what we call état généraux de l'alimentation. So it's about uh, food, agriculture, health, uh, with the agricultural sector and the food sector. And it's also very, very important uh, in France and uh, with the same time schedule. So we're very busy. Mm. 
We, the administration, I mean. <laughs> well, personally, I think I think that's I think it's useful. In other words, it, it may be very French, but it is a model. <laughs> no, because you're used to it. You talk about Assis, Cornell, others. Nice. No, I know. I mean, in the sense, others may not have those methodologies, yeah. <laughs> but in fact, it is a toolkit that others could look at, because it is a national level, it has a regional level, and it has a level of engagement and diversity across different. I guess different pillars is what you've described to us. Mm -hmm. You've one big idea of SEs, but there are separate pillars within it. So as a working model, mm -hmm. even if I use I say very French because you're used to doing that, others could look at the methodology of converting big societal objectives through these methodologies into actual outcomes. And that's why I wanted to start with you, because this is happening. It's not theoretical. It's real world, real time, and happening now. And so I think it's a very good point of departure of moving from high objectives of the Paris Agreement into detailed uh, consultation and planning. Let me, if I could then, uh, invite uh, Young Tae Kim to, to uh, make his opening remark. Uh, we have with us, and it's a great pleasure, the new Secretary General of the OECD's International Transport Forum, uh, someone with a long experience in the sector, especially in Korea, and now several months with your feet under the table in Paris. But to, to zoom up, so we have the French example. What, what is the OECD doing in transport terms? What is your big picture uh, follow-up to the Paris Agreement? And what particulars would you like to draw our attention to as work in progress at this point in time? Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes. You hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, the listening to the French case. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you. In, in fact, I'm uh, quite new because it's been uh, slightly more than uh, two months that I since I took up this position. So I'm learning also uh, a lot of things about this issue and a lot of different issues. But I was on the transport uh, management board of the ITF for the past two years. So actually, I followed on the up on the activities of ITF so far. So now I'm, I'm trying to concretize our project with my staff members in ITF, but I strongly believe that this issue is really important issue because it's the question of the humanity and it's the question of the global context that is applied not only to a specific country, but also to the rest of the world. So the basically, um, we are a platform um, housed in uh, OECD. Uh, that means that the platform where uh, 59 member countries exchange freely their experience and information about specific issues in the transport sector. But I think uh, climate change was considered as a, a separate issue uh, maybe uh, one or two decades ago, but now it's becoming a common issue that is fully integrated and incorporated in the transport sector. So that also helped us to uh, the link the transport with the other uh, sectors, which are very important because we need a holistic approach today. So uh, more concretely speaking, uh, we are uh, now uh, working on the uh, decarbonizing transport projects. It's a multi-year multi, multi -year project that are funded by our member countries and also by our the corporate partnerships like uh, Michelin uh, here, because we have now 28 uh, the private company uh, members in the uh, CPV framework and 50% uh, of the uh, normal contribution uh, coming from the CPB is allocated to the study of uh, decarbonizing the, the transport today. So actually we, uh, what we are doing now is that we try to uh, bring a, a lot of uh, evidence-based uh, you know, ingredients for each member countries so that they can prepare their own, own recipe because since uh, 2015, actually, we uh, came to uh, a consensus that each uh, country in the world, they uh, made some kind of commitment about the long-term, uh, the ambitious project of uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas and CO2 emissions, etc. But uh, when I was working in the Ministry uh, in, of Transport in Korea, I met a lot of my, uh, you know, the friends and colleagues from the international communities, and they say that 
We made our commitment, but uh, it's another question to how we uh, concretize that objectives and etc. So everyone has his own, uh, you know, the problem and uh, some, uh, you know, uncertainty about the future as well. So actually, we uh, ITF is now uh, preparing uh, for some analys analytical uh, the outcomes for each measures that can be taken by the government. Because we can think of two different categories. One is a technological approach that is um, relatively easily uh, quantifiable because according to the technological development, we can uh, you know, the measure the, uh, the improvement in a quanti quanti quantifiable way. But on the other hand, we have some uh, the policy measures that can uh, try to change the behavior and attitude of the passengers and uh, you know, customers and etc. But actually, it's not that easy to uh, quantify. But nevertheless, we uh, try to, uh, to provide some evidence-based analysis so that our member countries can you know, opt for certain measures to make their own combination to maximize the, uh, the, uh, the performance level of their you know, transport policy. So now um, we are going uh, that way. So we do not stick to the prescriptive uh, you know, recommendations because sometimes we face a uh, very strong uh, you know, controversy or criticism that the one solution cannot be applied to uh, the all countries in the world. So uh, maybe uh, we can just uh, provide very objective, uh, the neutral uh, outcomes of our research uh, uh, performance, and uh, maybe uh, if uh, our member countries can take some of them uh, to, to make their own productive policies, and if they face another problems, maybe also we can provide them with another advice and uh, we can cooperate with them how we can solve the next the problems coming, coming to us. So uh, in that context, we, we try our best. So we also uh, the communicate with the international organizations like uh, UN, United Nations. That's why I'm here today. So not only with, uh, not only, uh, with the, uh, our member countries, and, but also with the international organizations. So we are doing our best because uh, the climate change and climate issue has become a fundamental the baseline and the ground on which all the policy uh, the research is uh, conducted and uh, a lot of focus is uh, you know, paid to this issue. So we are doing, uh, hopefully we are doing a great job in cooperation with you. Yes, thank you very much. Well, th thank you for that introduction. I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, one, a model which is not prescriptive, the obvious presumption that one size doesn't fit all, uh, evidence-based, which, which people want, and even if I describe it in a utilitarian way, the emergence of a toolkit to, to assist policymakers. One of the questions I wonder, as, even as I look at our panel, on one side you have a representative of France and another side a representative of Morocco, and both are in ITF and you have, whatever, 57 other member states. Who is responsible for getting the measurement of measurements correct. Because one of the risks with it, but we also have our own national index of measurement, and somebody has to iron out the creases in measuring. Is, is, is that part of your job? Is that part of your mission for the future? To look at how we measure, index, get the templates, so that we consistently measure the nature of the change that we're driving. Those are a very uh, good question and actually a very uh, difficult problem in, in reality because sometimes uh, every country, country is a different. Some of the country, they made a uh, you know, top-down you know, approach. Uh, also, some other countries, they, uh, the, they made uh, the bottom-up approaches in uh, quantifying their commitment. But in the end, I think uh, we are uh, trying to help them to uh, develop a uh, productive measuring tool as well, because we do also um, the country-specific uh, uh, the research. Actually, uh, we we are focusing on the general the the framework work for uh, our member countries, 59 member countries. But also, uh, if our member countries wants, we we got in, we get involved strongly involved in. Uh, in, in cooperation uh, with them, uh, mm. focusing on their own situation. So if I find, if we find uh, some good measures, we 
easily circulate and uh, share that with our member countries because it's one of our you know very uh, desirable functions that uh, we um, to share our best practices and etc. But uh, really, uh, I it's really difficult to, to measure uh, how we can uh, proceed, uh, you know, to obtain our goals in the in the long term. But a lot of discussions and a lot of conversation uh, are really uh, helpful these days. And m maybe uh, if we continue to do that, we can uh, get some, uh, you know, best examples and best practices. Could I ask you just briefly to to describe to us the the state of development? and the idea behind something that uh, I saw in Leipzig this year in May, which is a decarbonization tool. Many people here will know it, but, but perhaps many not, because they're not member states, they are NGOs and so on. What is ITF offering in this tool? Yeah, actually, we try to, uh, first of all, we try to uh, raise awareness of the uh, importance of this issue, and uh, we are working, we have a very strong team for research, so we uh, touch on the technological aspect. Uh, for example, we are working, uh, strongly working on the uh, autonomous vehicle and automated vehicle, combining all those, the concept in the transport world with the uh, digitalization so that um, we can uh, reduce the uh, CO2 emissions in the end. But um, because the things are very uh, get, getting complex, so even the uh, experts in the transport world, they say, uh, all I know is that I know nothing, as a uh, Greek philosopher Socrates said <laughs> a long time ago. So because we are fighting and we are the playing with the uncertainty in mm. a sense, but uh, maybe uh, that's why we call uh, this age the fourth industrial revolution, because if we can uh, predict our future, it can be an evolution, but we talk about revolution, so maybe, but nevertheless, maybe uh, for the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, we were not well prepared because it came suddenly, but now we try to predict at least for our future, uh, mobilizing a lot of imagination uh, from uh, different stakeholders. So uh, I think uh, in so doing, maybe uh, we can reach a certain level of uh, you know, upgraded situation in the future. Okay, so it's, it, it, it's, it's a menu with evidence base, yeah. uh, but not a, a, a global fixed definitive prescription. Yeah. yeah. Okay. L let me turn, if I can, then to uh, Saeed Moulin. Uh, and it's very good that uh, we have you on the panel today because in the presidency of COP22 in Marrakesh, you took the baton from Paris and now we're here at COP23. Can you, I, I know your field is, is more in energy, but today we, we focus uh, on uh, transport. The evolution, the journey from Paris setting high objectives to getting down, deep down and dirty and doing that work, you bring us into the Marrakesh contribution to that and, and uh, your, 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 your current perspective on this. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to talk talk about energy, but uh, of course, when talking about energy efficiency, mm -hmm. one of the sectors is transport. I mean, you heard what's going on today in New Delhi. Uh, for one week, the air pollution in New Delhi reached a certain amount, and today there is a big issue on transport in big cities. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about the the way of working, and we organize in Morocco the État Généraux, mm -hmm. the l'efficacité énergétique. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, uh, it was a discussion between the private sector, the government, the NGOs, the development banks, European development banks also. Were mm -hmm. All actors were grouped and to discuss about all the action that we can have in a southern country, not a big emitter country, and to show that we can take some actions during the Marrakech event last year, I was in charge of the public-private partnership and uh, we developed some projects uh, linked to electrical mobility. We organized the Formula E event during the COP mm -hmm. for the first time to show, to sensibilize people about these new technologies concerning transport. And uh, we are measuring the air pollution in Marrakech and uh, we were looking at how we can decrease this air pollution linked to motorcycles and to sensibilize about electrical motorcycles was also an action. Um, today we have electric buses in Marrakech. It's one of the results of the, what we were pushing during the COP22. 
but to talk about the Marrakesh partnership. For us, uh, transport currently represents about 20% of greenhouse gas emissions, and unless action is taken, emissions will continue to grow. Actors in the Marrakesh partnership are already taking action across all modes of transport. You will hear from some of them in the session, and maritime transport and clean vehicles. We discussed also in Marrakesh about air transport, how actions were developed, and uh, in Montreal, Montreal last year, mm. that you heard about what happened for the, uh, some decisions containing the air transport. You will hear about all these initiatives during this day, but uh, the Marrakesh partnership was created recognizing that action by governments alone will not be enough to achieve the Paris goals. Success will depend on concerted action now from all levels of government, the private sector, civil society, NGOs, and territories, especially in the transport sector. You need to have policies with the cities. And some cities are taking some big actions today. You heard about uh, big cities like Paris, how they expect to, in 2030, to mm. stop some uh, technologies. And we are following that. A Moroccan is emitting seven times less CO2 than a European. Mm. And in all our policy, we were looking at how we can also be actor. Also, a southern country can take an advantage of that. That's why in the Business Federation, we have a commission dedicated to energy, climate, and green economy. Because we can develop jobs in this, in this sector. Because we believe that all countries in the south also have to take, to have to take in account this. One discussion we had last year because we were pushing to have the Formula E event mm -hmm. in Marrakesh. And of course, Formula E was developed in Europe, in Asia, in America, in South America, but not in Africa. And it was, we want to convince them that in our continent, there is a part also to start thinking about this energy transition. And that because of the situation of energy in this continent, we can find many, many solutions and also develop the private sector in the, in the south. Mm. We managed to do it in energy, in renewable energy. Today we have to uh, have uh, industry linked to renewables for wind mills, for example, 70% uh, of the spare parts are produced in Morocco. We managed to have this industry integration because we have a strategy, because we can give visibility. So all the spirit of the uh, Marrakesh partnership is to have all the actors together and to give the solutions and to make the proposition to the governments about how we can develop such things. Okay, l l let, let me ask you on that because we saw in the French example a working model of, of such a partnership. Do you have a sense from the presidency overview of last year and what has happened in the last 12 months, how many states are actually doing something like this? Because the idea is there the methodologies are there, and you always have the ones who lead and the ones who follow later. How many are in that leading position? Do you have any sense of that from, from the presidency? <laughs> it will be difficult to answer, but the spirit of the Marrakesh partnership is to give all the success stories, all the historical, political situ situations that are developed in many countries to others. So the spirit when we have discussion with other countries, especially from the south, mm. said, look, of course, especially in the transport, the main countries are in the north that are developing such. And uh, when discussing about southern countries, they said, okay, we still need to have the development. We still have, said, yes, you can have a clean development right now. And look what is going on in Marrakesh, but also what in other cities in the south. Some cities are, we are pushing, uh, we are following also, for example, in, in Tunisia also for uh, public transport, how we can have a, a great policy, but uh, also in uh, Asia, we have many success stories that are uh, uh, underway. And uh, all our electrical mobility that developed in Morocco was also with uh, Chinese uh, actors that we are looking all. So, so I think the the, the big import, the most important thing about the market partnership that is concerning many, many sectors, seven sectors, industry, mm. water, energy, mm. transport, mm. and others. So uh, for us is to have this spirit in mind, to have all the actors in mind, 
to make the proposition and to um, to to spare this uh, to uh, <laughs> to 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 share yes. with all the actors uh, the this approach. Uh, le let me ask if we, if we look south. And if we look at, uh, you're well placed because you had this presidency, you focused on COP, you've developed a partnership concept. To what extent are you in a position to be a driver or a motivator of a pan-African <laughs> consciousness? And where is it? Because if we look south, it's a very big space yeah. and, and you, you, you are an important leader in this space, but relative to the whole continent, relatively small. So is that energy okay. finding a wave of expression? Completely. During the COP22 in Marrakesh, Ame, I'm head of the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency, I signed with 22 organizations in Africa, cooperation, and uh, of course, we, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about capacity building, we're talking about policy that's giving visibility. All our projects for energy was developed with the private sector mm. because we managed to have uh, a strategy showing visi giving visibility to actors, giving visibility that a private company can invest, that we managed to attract green money because we have this visibility. Of course, you need for that also governance and transparency. Yes. That's how we reached the lowest price in renewables today. We reached three cents per kilowatt hour for the wind by a private project. Three cents per kilowatt hour for its uh, amazing one. We were also amazed on by yeah. the price proposed by different actors, but it's uh, incredible what's happening. And what's worked. happening in the transport sector also is coming, mm. and we're going to have some surprise, I think, about that. So we believe that when you have this visibility, when you give this vision, when you have uh, transparency, when you give uh, possibility for the private sector to invest, uh, how we managed to have the green financing for the renewables, it's one thing. We are fighting now to have green financing for energy efficiency. It's not as easy. It's more easy to finance big projects than uh, many small projects. And uh, we are helping uh, uh, taxi men in Morocco to switch from old cars to a new, uh, very more efficient uh, energy car. Uh, not electric car, but hybrid car on this. Mm. So we are pushing and putting some money for that. The financial institution is very important. We get with um, we developed with EBRD and the European Union mm. uh, the, um, the MORSEF, Moroccan Sustainable Energy Financial Facility. It was very important to, with local banks to help any investor in energy efficiency to have a loan or to have even 10% grant thanks to the EU for that. Right. So we managed to have that because you can have a policy. What we are sharing with actors in Africa is that even mobility in Africa can change, and we have some big cities today that it's impossible uh, uh, to have, you know, when, when you have more than 10 million people in a city, and you have some cities in Africa that are reaching this amount, you cannot have the same approach, especially for transport, and you need to have some change, and you need to have, it's a matter of health, before climate change, maybe, mm -hmm. but it's something that has to be developed. Thank you very much for that. You've been talking about partnership, so it's a nice segue to go to uh, Holger Dalkman, who is the uh, co-chair of the SLOCAT partnership. And that partnership is indeed one of the mobilizers of a lot of diverse actors who are in the non-state sector. So Holger, over to you for your observations. Thanks, Pat, and uh, good, good morning, everybody. So I think what we already he heard loud and clear, and we have to repeat it again and again, first of all, Without transporters, Paris will fail. And I think this is really important when it comes to the NDCs, when it comes to the Marrakesh partnership, as well as when it comes to any other, other alliance. So let me reflect a little bit around those, these three, three, three elements. Uh, first of all, um, we, the, the good thing out of Paris was obviously now as a country, so they have to deliver and, and come up with the NDCs. Good news. NDCs transport is in 75% of uh, of the countries recognized transport is an issue. That's a good news. Not so good news is most of these countries currently don't have a sectoral target. 
There's often also not a roadmap. Many of, of, of the countries in the NDCs are so focusing on very specific activities instead of really being also comprehensive. Particularly, we talk a lot here so in this area about passenger transport, and this is absolutely vital. But we also have to see also where the emissions coming from is, is freight transport, almost to the same 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 extent. So so here I think this is a is a is a good starting point. But now also this is a moment also for countries, and we see that in in different places also to 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 step up. So there's a just so so a, a nice study came out from uh, uh, GIZ is uh, Daniel Bongert and from Agora Verkehrsen and Christian Hofert, uh, looking particular in the G20, and we already see from us what is submitted us in the NDC to what is now so being done in the countries, in countries like France, in in Germany, that they are now moving us to, towards us, so to looking looking into the details. Second, secondly, and you already talked about the partnership, Marrakesh was was a milestone in saying, well, governments can't do it alone. This also needs to be done. Uh, with also the, the so-called non-state actors. I, I, I don't know who, it's, a, it's such a yeah, technical term, so we have to think about something also which the rest of the world and not people just here in this room really also understand, because these are actually the key players also who, who, who are responsible also for for making that change, and I'm I'm very pleased that uh, Slowcat work with uh, uh, Move On and uh, to create also the Paris process on uh, mobility and climate PPMC, and and the PPMC also brought all these initiatives together, collected 15 initiatives by in in Paris. Now there are 21, and it's really exciting things which will always hear us later. So please also watch us in that space, because we need also the sectoral activities. We need also the, the, the alliance from walking up to, to shipping and aviation. So and everything is also there, 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 there important. And finally, is it's good to have national governments, it's good to have also these partnerships, but we also have to think about also how this is also coming together, and I really liked also um, the, the, the reference also to the, to the French model, so it's, it's really about, and, and here uh, what um, uh, PPMC together and under leadership also as countries like Portugal, uh, like France, uh, Costa Rica, Netherlands, mm. uh, together with cities and companies like Michelin, Alstom, saying, well, we need also to work together. We need mm. to come up uh, with cities, with companies, and with, with countries saying, well, we also t have to take leadership together. And we will establish this morning, uh, Jose Mendes, from, uh, Vice Minister from Portugal, already at the press conference this morning announced the establishment of the Transport Decarbonization mm. Alliance. Um, and we will have, uh, hosted by France, uh, a side event at, uh, at, at five o'clock yes. to here so to, to, to launch it. So partnership is important. Another one I have to reference also and should reference is Sustainable Mobility for All with the Secretariat of uh, the World Bank saying we need clear goals, we need also tracking framework and we need also action. Um, and, and part of this action, and let me close that, is good also to have these partnerships, but it also needs to have a clear idea as to how we get there. And, and for that reason, the PPMC developed also a so-called global roadmap, so uh, towards decarbonization. In very simple terms, in eight, eight elements, saying, okay, this is also what the world in total and everybody has to do to really also decarbonize. And this is a, is, a, is a document, and here Nicolas will also speak later to that, Patrick Oliver is, 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 is here for Michelin. And it's good to have this roadmap, but then it's bringing that into, mm. the, into the countries, bringing that also to, this, to, to the stakeholders, saying what are our policies, what are our specific actions we need. And here, so bringing that together with tools which already exist, like from, from the ITF, who is doing a wonderful job there to use that. And if we have then also the political commitment and also the stakeholders, I, I hope that we can really accelerate transport. Holger, thank you for introducing. It has been 
kind of a wide range of things we've covered, but you introduced something. I had something. to tick all these boxes. Oh, but you there. introduced actually a box and a little tick, which I want to pause for thought. Um, you said that transport is mentioned in 75% of the nationally determined contributions. So one gap already in 25%, <laughs> it is zero. So I observed this. The second element you mentioned is that mostly there are no sustainable or sectoral targets. It's, it's mentioned, but it's not target. And there's no specific roadmap. Now, in a way, when we have methodologies, the Marrakesh Partnership idea, Les Assises in France, uh, the decarbonisation tool of ITF, we're talking about the methods that can assist the evolution of this. But who needs to push this? Is this partly a top-down push, nudge, incentive from the UN side? Is it a bottom-up process for all these partners we talk about, state and non-state actors, who have to knock on the door of the political consciousness at home and say, it's not good enough that you mentioned it as a word, you've got to drill it down, put in some targets, some dates, some projects, some numbers. Who has to do this? Well, the, 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 the very simple answer out of that is all of the above. So, <laughs> but uh, because, because, but let, let's uh, first of all, let's be fair in, in terms of this analysis. This is also the initial uh, uh, contribution and commitment. Also, countries came to Paris. So we already are so two years after, and I, as I said, are so countries countries working on it. So we see, for example, are so now uh, Germany had set the so last year target. Now they have uh, trying so to figure out so how to do that. Mm. But so 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 here this is 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 early days, and I think it's it it needs that push so that that we need so that. Secondly, I would argue yes, so this is a space so to put pressure on because countries have to deliver if all the NDCs do not add up and currently they don't add up or so we will we will fail so so therefore there is a pressure from here but also national government then also have to be serious about that and it's not just the environment ministry it's a it's a it's a ministry for finance it's a ministry of transport who now also have to get into in into that process and saying this is also our 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 target but also have a process like we hear also uh, later on uh, from 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 portugal like we were in france okay how can we also convene all the different stakeholders or is it to take the action and, and, and we hear not often enough speaking also with businesses to say, well, how can we also that, that deliver? Because often also the message is, oh, this is a climate issue, but also we have to look uh, in, 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 into, uh, into our jobs, into our economy. And, and the clear message there is it has to be also climate and economy also goes together. And there's a gain, and it's actually, it's, it's actually uh, from an economic perspective, it's the right thing also to do. Okay. Look, I, th I think that's very useful. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I want to turn to the audience. And in fact, as, as I'm looking at the audience, given that his name has come up uh, at least once, if not more than once, Patrick Oliver, very quickly, because I know you could give a very long account of this, this idea about roadmaps and know-how and can-do. And of course, everyone is diverse, as has been mentioned. One size doesn't fit all. What can you tell us about a not one size fits all roadmap as an idea? I think you yes, need sir. to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pat, for the opportunity. Uh, yes, we've been developing this roadmap with this uh, very notion of developing a macro roadmap. In other words, our effort has been to try to come up with the very basis of what all countries should do. In other words, we're just saying, please open up eight chapters in the analysis at the same time. If you don't open up them, you will never succeed because you will never reach this net zero emission situation or economy that the Paris Agreement is looking for. So what we're saying is uh, use it as a basis. And, and France is currently doing it in this way. We've been working with Morocco, with Africa. Uh, we are now engaging something with, uh, with India. And uh, as you know, we are also considering putting Europe you know, um, on, that, um, on, the, on that basis. But the very idea is to say, if we don't use some kind of commonality of effort mm. in the countries, never will we reach a cost in the transition. 
and uh, Holger was talking about the economic power. Never will we reach a cost which will be acceptable to societies. At the same time, never will we reach the political support, uh, the political courage which is needed, because it needs, it requires political courage. If the governments, if the mayors know that they are not alone in pushing something, then the political difficulty is much less. So what I want to emphasize is that by developing this kind of basic element, we're trying at the same time to make the transition realistic and feasible economically. We're trying to make the political courage acceptable once again, and we're creating a phasing, at the same time a synergism in the way to move on. And we think that this is the only way we can succeed. Now that I have a mic, I'd can, like to can ask I, Can I ask you if someone here wants to see your roadmap, yeah. where yeah. can they find it, apart from talking to you? Where is it? ppmc-transport.org. ppmc-transport.org, and you look at uh, Thank you. roadmap. If I may, okay. one thing which has not been mentioned. <clears throat> the Paris Agreement talks about a net zero emission mm. situation. Mm. We're talking about all the efforts we can do to reduce um, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. We never talk about the negative emissions which we will have to have if we are to reach a net zero emission. I urge the governments and the UN to launch a big international program on negative emissions. I stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patrick. Does anyone else in the audience, just for a very brief comment, want to make a comment, pose a question? Yes, please. Can you can you go to the microphone? The the, the microphones are fixed there to your uh, to your right hand side. Please introduce yourself, and then. Thank you. My name is Zoltan Sabo, and I'm sustainability consultant. And um, I'm grateful that uh, the UN is having a transport day. And what I'm missing is a key element. So there are lots of uh, measures available in transport, how to decarbonize it. But uh, so far, I haven't seen major discussions on one of the key elements. And the key element here I'm talking about is biofuels or ethanol in general. And uh, what we have seen so far, and this was touched upon in the, in the panel discussions, is that actually sectoral uh, disruptions already happening. So in France, uh, for instance, 10%, uh, more than 10% of the oil is replaced by ethanol. In Brazil, Sweden, Finland, more than 20, 30% are replaced by by sustainable biofuels. So the, uh, in the US, Europe, uh, China, India. So there are, there are initiatives, there are drivers that are going in that direction and can actually bring decarbonization today at scale. So many of the discussions uh, are focused on the future uh, de decarbonization efforts, but I think the urgency is here and uh, every single day we delay actions, we make it uh, more costlier and make it more uh, um, actual um, um, uh, climate change make, may, will become uh, increasing. So, and uh, another aspect is that it is cost effective. Uh, this is also often ignored in discussions. What we need is uh, decarbonization measures that are available at scale and at, at uh, a cheap price. And this is what uh, biofuels ethanol can offer. Sure, look, so I, I, th I thank, thank you for you that. Very much. I thank you for that observation and thank you very much for the contribution. I'm going to make a quick comment on that. I'm going to ask each panelist, and I'll come back to you in a moment, to think of one thing that you want to leave on the record today as the thing that should be said. So think about that, please. As regards the ethanol and the alternative fuels question, thank you for raising it. Uh, the reason why it hasn't been so much a subject here is because it will be one of the subjects that we're, we're uh, coming to. In particular, when we're dealing with freight, we have on the panel the Global Efficiency Fuel Initiative, and a lot of those things come up in that. So indeed, you make a relevant point, but we've kind of 
parceled up our day in, in different uh, parts, and we haven't specifically got into the whole alternative fuel mix, uh, the new infrastructures and uh, the, the, the intermediate efficiencies that can be gained and so on, but it's a point uh, that you've made and that is, uh, is, is well made, and we will be coming back to it uh, today. Now, this idea of the one thing you would like to say, um, tough luck, Holger, but I'm going to start with you since you were last. The last shall be first. What do you want to tell us? Your one sentence of wisdom that we should take away with us today, Holger. The, 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 the good singer, so I'm back in Germany, so we have very long sentences. <laughs> like, but well, that <laughs> could even be one <laughs> word in Germany. In one word, Holger. <laughs> That's also then a long one. So No, but what, what, I, what I said before, we, we, we need to accelerate action and responsibility from government, from non-state actors, from businesses, and bring us that together in efficient partnership to really to scale up and and not just as a talk, but do things. Thank you. Please say thank you. I think to spread the data, the information, one thing very important, and what what the champions built within these last two years, it's. We're going to be published the first yearbook on climate action. It is the result of uh, all the actions that will be solemnly transmitted to the UN Secretary on the 15th in Bula Zone at 6 p.m. The spirit of all this market partnership is to give this information coming from the ground. So what all the actions in the transport sector will be in this document. And we would like to have more people present this day Okay. Because this, it will be the first yearbook on climate action on all sectors, but also in the tra transport sector. And I think all the information can be pushed, and w that's why we need also your support for that. Thank okay. you. Kim. Yeah. I think uh, the top level uh, control tower and uh, the productive uh, governance on the uh, national level is a very important issue today because, you know, uh, the Minister of Environment, they negotiate on the international scene and actually they echo the messages to the, uh, the domestic actors. But finally, unless we get support from the industry or local government, actually it's not easy to uh, attain, attain that, that goal. So actually uh, there are strong disrupt disruption in each member countries. As uh, an intergovernmental the body, uh, ITF, the covering all modes of transport, actually we observe the kind of disruptions every day. So even we try to extend our activities to the energy sector and uh, social sector and as well, but uh, we will uh, need some more time to strengthen our cooperation even uh, in the international level. Thank you. Virginie. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, to come back to what you said, uh, there, are, there, are, there are countries that don't have the transport in their NDCs. And <laughs> I was thinking about this, but I think countries will include the transport in their NDCs if they see first they can operationalize mm. it, yeah. make it concrete in their policies. So first, this is, I think, the, 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 the biggest element. So you can translate it in your legislation, but you can so also, and this is, I think, more important, uh, uh, construct territorial policies. If you help your territories, your collectivities, to construct a, a transport policy that is sustainable, this is where you will have results. And this is the kind of result you can't have if you don't work with the mobilization of the whole society together to find solutions that are adapted to each uh, situation. And I think this is the main, uh, uh, the, the, the main subject that will make the, the, the transport inside the policies, mm. inside the city policies, inside the country policies. And, and, and the last word is that we, we must never forget that with this tr uh, transition to new way of transport, we are creating a new economy. And we have to support innovation and economic development this way. And so in the end, we will have new jobs even if there will be some jobs that will be destroyed, we will create new jobs and new situations. And I think this is what the countries uh, must have in mind when they are uh, putting transport inside of their NDCs. Thank you very much. I think this has been a very useful overview to set the scene for what we do today. I think the theme clearly is taking vision and turning it into action. It's about moving from talking to doing. It's about from the doing part to delivering 
and that's the process of transformation that we've discussed here. Uh, I think the, the challenge we know, the gaps have been identified, but the good news is there are methodologies, there are ways of doing it, and you can talk to the people who are doing it if you're not doing it yet, because everyone is always willing to share good practice. And I think that's a, a very positive message. I think it's very clear that we've understood that we need to break out of silos, ministerial silos, governance silos, because everything is connected to everything else, and we need to find that ecosystem of connection which lives outside silos because it requires a high level of engagement and interactivity. And I think a very big message here, and it's the final point that has been made by Virginie, this is, this is not a win-lose trade-off. If we get the climate thing right, we get the economic thing right as well. This is a formula of transformation, but a message of win-win, and not a dialogue of win-lose. Mm -hmm. And if we get that into our heads, that too can be a key behavioural driver. Thank you all very much for taking the time to be here, and please show your appreciation for our wonderful panel. Thank you.